Okay, now we're good. Okay, so let's start. We've got two lectures on Fanon. Uh, one when you get back from reading week. And one right now. The, there's a part of this that may overlap with next week, but I think we need to do it in both, so that's okay. what looked like it might be a snow day. Um, on violence is probably the most quoted Fanon essay. Let me just do his dates first, okay? So Franz Fanon, 1925 to 1961. Remember he was a student of Anise Césaire in Martinique? And I'll come back to some information on Fanon in a second. So I don't know. I, I don't know if you've read The Wretched of the Earth in other classes. Um, I certainly teach it in psychology and politics of psychological disorders that go with decolonization on, on for both the colonized and the colonizers. So On Violence is the first essay in Wretched of the Earth. Um, it was published in 1961, a few months before Fanon died. He died in December 61. Now, Fanon, and I'm sure you may know this, because Fanon is an incredibly well-known political thinker and political theorist, but he was, a, he was trained as a psychiatrist in France. He was born in Martinique. He worked at a hospital in Algeria during the Algerian War of Independence. And that War of Independence went from 54 to 62, so it was an eight-year war of independence. Shortly after, then, there was a civil war that lasted a very long time. He really is known as a key theorist of revolution, colonialism, a key critic of imperialism. Um, he's also a real critic of sort of the ethics and morality of, of Western European humanity. He's obviously an anti-racist thinker. And I would really argue in his work on um, both the colonized and the colonizer, he manages to blow Freud's theory of the Oedipal complex out of the water. That is, he, when you're in a war-torn situation, you don't manifest the same. And, it, and what, why this is important and why Said says it's important um, is that it really shows, although this is not a course on psychology and politics, but I think it's important. <laughs> It really shows that the assumptions underlying psychoanalysis are embedded in a particular time, culture, class, and I won't say ethnicity, but I would say that they only apply in, or they seem to apply in liberal democracies that are either functioning or falling apart. They don't apply in the colonial situation. That is, when you take a look at the dreams of colonial subjects, you don't find similar dreams that you would find in um, Western European subjects that have to do with the, the Oedipal complex of like revenging against your father. What you have are terrified dreams of people who are under siege and have been born under siege and, and live an extreme life of violence. So it's completely different. So I think if in my books, I mean, look, Fanon changed how we understand violence. He really is a decolonial thinker. I think he also changed for me how one understands psychoanalysis, and I think that's really, really important. I mean, Fanon draws on, what's interesting, I think, in, in Russia of the Earth, the Black Skin White Masks, and the Battle for Earth, the war, what's it called, the Algerian Independence War. Um, what, so he's got a book, it's either called that, or it has to do with Veil, and it has to do with women fighting in the independence war. And I'll, I'll check that, I'll look that up for next week because I want to talk a bit about it. But what Fanon really does is, I think, and, and why he's on the course, is he allows you to understand at almost a visceral level 
what's missing in the history of Western political thought. Um, and that is that, that what's missing in the canon is a critique of racism, is a critique of colonialism. Um, and what's missing in the canon of psychoanalysis is a critique of the concepts that were used to understand people's um, maladies, right? And Fanon has an understanding of violence that's different than anyone we've done, we've, we've studied before. It builds on it. So what I was going to say when I moved over there and I, I moved to another train of thought was Fanon really draws on existentialism. Fanon draws on psychoanalysis. Fanon draws on Marxism. He draws on some of the feminism at his time in terms of liberation um, struggle, struggles and liberation feminism. Um, and he, he really is interested in critiquing a new human being and starting from the ground up. And so one of the things he argues is that in a liberation struggle and in decolonization, you end up creating a new human being. That you can't, that the, the human being that comes out of that, as um, Cesare said, is, is draws on past history and critiques Western understanding of humanity and also moves forward to a future understanding. So Fanon treated both, what's interesting when he writes about the colonial mental disorders, I'm not lecturing on them in this class, but they're at the back of this book. So if you've got the book, take a look Colonial War and Mental Disorders, it's really worth reading. Fanon treated both colonized and colonizer, who were part of what, and I'm gonna to go to this slide, because I wanted you to see how to spell the name, and if I put out a new slide, I have to re, I have to re number them all, and I was on the subway, so. Um, what Atu Siki Utu, who taught here for many, many years, and I studied with him, um, what he sees as a dialectic of violence. So Fanon treated both colonized and colonizer, who were part of what Atusiki Utu describes as a dialectic of violence. That is a dialectic that plays out as Hegel saw the master-slave dialectic playing out in history. And if you take a look, Fanon's dialectic of experience, which is 1996, if you take a look at it, Siki Utu sees Fanon's work as being heavily influenced by Hegel's master slave dialectic. And of course, Fanon is also influenced by Sorel, Sorel's understanding of violence. So just to sort of situate it, um, I did, what did I do with that too? It was a grad class on Frankfurt School. So if you situate, if you situate Fanon, He's very much influenced by Hegel's independent and dependent consciousness, um, a revolutionary subject becoming a for itself. He's also very much influenced by Sorel's understanding of the proletarian revolution and by Sorel's understanding of the force of the state and the violence of those fighting against the state. In addition, he's, in, he's introduced by, or he's influenced by Sartre's understanding of, of situationism, that you are born in a location, that you do what you can with that, that it's located, because Sartre also was a historical materialist, existentialist. Uh, Fanon is also very much influenced by Marx, class struggle, class consciousness. Walter Benjamin. He's influenced by Benjamin's understanding of the founding and maintaining aspects of violence that the state uses. So these all kind of come together in a trajectory with Fanon. And of course, he's also influenced very much by um, Annie Césaire in terms of understanding that, that there's no excuse for Western imperialism, that in creating a new human being, you have to 
also aim at, at creating a new uh, human being in the West, but you have to draw on past culture and bring it together with future culture. So he's influenced by all of, all of those um, tenets. Now the Algerian War of Independence, which one of, was one of the first ones, it's also known as the Algerian Revolution. And it's a war, it was a war between France and Algeria. The Algerian National Liberation Front, the FLN, which Fanon belong, belonged to. So there was a war between France, French officials, French military, French troops on the ground, and the Algerian National Liberation Front, the FLN, which went from 54 to 62. So Algeria gained independence from France in 62. It's an extremely important, the Algerian independence struggle or the Algeri Algerian independence revolution is an extremely important decolonization war. It was characterized by guerrilla, guerrilla warfare on the part of the indigenous people. It was also characterized by military and French resistance forces. Torture was used on both sides, but primarily by the French, by the French um, military and French police officers that were part of the uh, colonial administration. It also was a civil war between Algerians who supported French Algeria and had a good position in society and their counterparts who were fighting against, who were completely exploited by the society. So then, once you get, so what, in independence, and I'm just gonna give you this so you have an idea. The other thing you should know, I think, is that the dominant population in Algeria has always been Muslim. Um, the dominant Muslim um, ethnicity is 96% Sunni with 1.3 Shia and 1% Christian. So when they're talking about the indigenous um, people, when, he, Fran, when uh, Fanon is talking about the indigenous Algerians, he's talking primarily about Muslim Algerians. So in, when independence was reached in 62, you had 900,000 European Algerians going back to France because they were really afraid, because their, their, their occupation was brutal, um, their rule was brutal. So they were really afraid of the FLN's revenge once they came to power. So the French government, of course, wasn't prepared for this number of refugees. And the other thing that the the European Algerians did, and this is like really awful, um, is that when they left, the they, majority of the Algerian Muslims who worked with the French in the army, they disarmed them. Um, they were left behind with a treaty between France and Algeria. And the treaty declared that no actions could be taken against them. But because they were seen as traitors, and because they'd served as auxiliary within the French army, um, the FLN ended up killing between, and they, these figures are really broad, right, because it's between 50 and 150,000 um, of the, the people that were involved in the French army and their family members. They were murdered by FLN, or lynch mobs, and they were tortured. Okay, so so Fanon's dead by this time, but I'm I'm sure Fanon would not condone that once you come to power, you end up killing your brothers and sisters who had supported the other side. I mean that just kind of set up the situation for an endless civil war, um, and it's really problematic. And it's also problematic what the French did by leaving with a treaty and assuming that after all the violence that was perpetuated 
on the Algerian population by those working for the French, but they would just say, okay. Like there was no, there was no attempt to, to mediate that. What then happens is you get a, an off and on, and then an ongoing civil war from 1991. The Civil War is, the FLN once in power doesn't want to give up power, even though elections have elected what they considered an Islamic rebel group. Um, even though that so it would be a, a, a group that was in opposition to them. So they negated the victory and stayed in power. So there was an attempt then to crush the, the movement. But between 1994 and 5, violence just reached a level that it became clear that it, that it really was not going to, that it was, the government was not going to maintain power. And so fighting continued, and it became clear that the FLN government had also lost popular support, partly because of their corruption. Um, and it continued for several years afterwards. Um, it continued until 2002. So in, it was a 19-year state of emergency, um, which began in 1992 and ended in 2002. And it really started over the new and really popular Islamic Salvation Front, FIS, was defeating the ruling FLN party in parliamentary elections so they canceled the elections, and the military took control of the government. So you see, I mean, partly, I'm sort of giving that background, because I don't expect you to know it. But also, there's a problem in that, if you come in, it goes back to what Benjamin's talking about. If you come into power on violence, and you found a new regime, as the FLN did, the only way, really, to stay in power is to maintain that violence, and that's what they did. When the opposition became strong enough, because, and, and actually won a part, so the people voted in the opposition. They won a parliamentary election. What the option then is, is to, you know, do what we do in parliamentary democracies to see victory, um, or bring in the military. They brought in the military. So you've got, so it's, I mean, Algeria was a beautiful country that was really rather, uh, like, destroyed by a colonial war, an anti-colonial war, independent struggle, and then they weren't able to rebuild. It was destroyed by a civil war. So people are, are very poor and it's, and, and I mean, partly it's, it's exactly what Fanon's gonna say, but it's also what Benjamin's saying, and that is that, and what we were saying in terms of, of neo-imperialism, that once the, imperialist or colonial country or administration has exited, either you have an indigenous group that comes in and tries to keep everything running, but they need to have affiliations either with the original colonial power or with another colonial power. And Fanon sort of really sets that out in the context of Algeria. Now he's talking, Fanon's talking, so this is not a quote from Atchisi Shiyuki, this is Fanon. Um, he's talking about two kinds of violence. He's talking about the violence of the colonial regime. That's the violence that Sorel calls force. And in the case of Algeria, it was the founding, it became, what was the force there was um, French, and it occurred in the founding moment of French domination, 1827 to 1930. And I'll talk a bit about that. And it was maintained by what was known as direct rule from 1830 to 1962. And second, what you have is the counter-violence of the Algerian people, the people fighting for independence. Now, just in terms of what we've read before, in terms of Sorel, the colonist colonizer, uses the force of the state and the colonized, the colonial subject, uses violence of resistance. What Fanon says, 
What Fanon says is that colonialism, this is on page 23 of Wretched of the Earth on, on violence, he says colonialism is naked violence and only gives in when confronted with a greater violence. Fanon was very famous for saying you can't, you have to confront colonialism with a violence equal or greater, which becomes really problematic because on the one hand, you have the colonial regime fighting with military equipment, fighting with the police force, and you have the indigenous people fighting with whatever they can get. So it's not, it's not a fair struggle at all. Now if you go to page, if you, sorry, does somebody have my counter? No, okay, don't. So if you go to page five, but first I wanna do this. So it's the colonists, what Fanon says is, it's the colonists who fabricated and continues to fabricate the colonial subject. It's the, so it's very much which, what I mean, say, Suzanne says, it's the colonist who created the colonist. That decolonization is a creation, or is truly the creation of new human beings. But in the process of, de now, in the process for non, of decolonization, you create a new human being. When that creation is grounded in civil violence and hatred, among the people fighting. Um, so the FLN was a, the dominant group. The ALN was also a, a less dominant group, that, which then came back and won the election under a different name many years later. So decolonization is the creation of a new human being. If that is done in bloodshed, which colonial wars are, um, it's really hard not to carry that into the post colonial independence period. Uh, particularly if you have factions within the indigenous population. Now he uses the term thing there very consciously. This is on page two. He says the thing colonized, because we go back to Marx's idea of commodity fetishism and that human and alienation, that humans take on a thing-like characteristic. So the thing colonized becomes a human being, he says man, most of the time, through the very process of liberation. That's in the process of liberating the country, one takes on a new humanity and, and ceases to be a thing, but becomes a human being. This is directly drawn from both Hegel and from, so Hegel in terms of the uh, oppressed becoming a for itself through work, very much influenced by that, and Marx's idea of alienation. Now if you go, it's actually slide five, it's not page five yet. Algeria was put under direct French rule in 1827. It was done with a blockade by the French Navy and was a blockade of Algiers. So if you get a chance, I might show an excerpt out of it. Um, if you get a chance, look on YouTube uh, for Battle of Algiers. It's a brilliant movie. Um, this blockade lasted from 1830 to 1962 under a variety of French governmental systems. So from 1848 on, so remember Marx is writing about 1848 in Europe, from 1848 until independence, the Mediterranean region of Algeria was administered as a part of France, but they did not have citizenship. That is, it was a part of France with no rights. The French governed Algeria internally, direct colonialism. They brought Algeria under the laws of the French constitution. So as a subject, you had to obey the laws of the French constitution without any of the rights guaranteed by it. They developed a policy they appropriately called paternalism, which governed people by providing for what they considered their needs. But if you get a description of the, the division of the population, this Manichaean division of the population, the needs were seen as much lesser. So it was paternalism, governed people by providing for their needs as they assessed them, but gave no rights. 
That is, there was no French citizenship for Muslim Algerians, which is 96% of the population of Sunni, 1.3 Shia, and 1.1% Christian. And there was a uh, there was a two percent one to two percent Jewish population at one point. Now I don't know if that adds up, but it was one point something, so it should add up. The local population was assimilated to French culture, particularly what became the national bourgeoisie. So if you take a look then. Let's do this before we take a look at that. So what Fanon says, and this is quite well known, colonialism is not a thinking machine, nor a body endowed with reasoning faculties. It is violence in its natural state and will only yield when confronted with greater violence. That, that colonial power is not going to give over without a struggle. that there's been no instance, so at that point, and I'm trying to think if there's been an instance since, where a country that was dominating another country in a colonial situation peacefully exited. So colonialism is not a thinking machine nor a body endowed with reasoning faculties. It is violence in its natural state and will only yield when confronted with greater violence, which is really problematic because two things happen. It's really difficult, as you know, to have greater violence and win a guerrilla warfare when the other side has all the heavy equipment. Um, and the process of doing so then ends up usually afterwards in a factional fight in a civil war where people who just want to live existentially, their lives end up being killed. So it's, it's just really um, a terrible situation. And Fanon, unfortunately, was not around to see the latter part of that. His wife was, um, Josie's uh, Fanon. And there's a, a, a book, which I'm going to read on break, where there's an interview with Fanon, the last, uh, her on Fanon's last days of life. And as she's giving the interview, there's like a civil war going on in the street, like one of the first outbreaks. So the process of decolonization that is what Sorel would call the violence of resistance. What he would compare maybe to a political general strike that, that develops into a proletarian general strike when the mass of population are mobilized. This is the process of decolonization. So if you look at page two, and I think it's really worth looking at this. The, the top paragraph on page two where Fanon is writing about decolonization. And Fanon, in like a single paragraph here, and what goes down into a, another paragraph, so I might read both of them. Um, so decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the world, is clearly an agenda for total disorder. But it cannot be accomplished by the wave of a magic wand, a natural cataclysm, or a gentleman's agreement. Decolonization, we know, is a historical process. In other words, it can only be understood, it can only find its significance and become self-coherent insofar as we can discern the history-making movement which gives it form and substance. Decol decolonization is an encounter between two congenitally antagonistic forces that in fact owe their singularity to the kind of reification secreted and nurtured by the colonial situation. So remember uh, reification discussed in Marx and then discussed in uh, Lukács. And it's a term, it's a, it's a, in a sense, an existentialist term that is used to describe the situation one is in. So rather than being um, in a situation of objectification where you can act as a for itself, you're in a reified situation where you basically have a class consciousness that doesn't realize your potential. You have a class consciousness that ends up being internalized from the oppressor themselves. Their first, their, their first confrontation was colored by violence and their cohabitation. That is, in, in, when, when the French colonialists first arrived, it was colored by violence, and the entire cohabitation is colored by violence, continued at the point of the bayonet and under cannon fire. Now, 
the colonist and the colonizer owed acquaintances. And consequently, and you saw this quote before, and consequently, the colonist is right when he says he knows them. Because it is the colonist who fabricated and continues to fabricate the colonial subject. That is, the, the colonist derived his validity, his wealth, from the colonial system. And then if you read the next paragraph, I won't, I won't read the beginning of it. Um, I'm going to read the last two sentences, three sentences there. Decolonization is truly the creation of a new human being. He says new men. Of new men. But such a creation cannot be attributed to a supernatural power. The thing, here, the colonized, becomes a man through the very process of liberation. So his, he's got a really uh, condensed understanding of decolonization that, that operates throughout the book on page two and the top of page three. And I want to slide seven. Okay, slide eight, which is precisely what I just read. The colonist and the colonized our old acquaintances. The colonist is right when he says he knows them. It's a colonist who fabricated and continues to fabricate the colonized subject. So what you see happening there is a very much an understanding of, of Marx's dialectic, of historical materialism, of the ideological superstructure of that, that how the colonized subject is fabricated as a subject and constructed in discourses of power, to go back to Foucault, and for the colonists to stay in power, they, they derive their validity from doing it. So the colonial discourses are embedded in a power knowledge system, to go to Foucault, that in which the colonial subject is constructed. What Fanon's saying there, influenced by Marxism and existentialism, is that, that in a sense, and you'll say it later, but you can't really tell what the Algerian population would be like in a situation that wasn't a colonial situation. When you're born into a colonial situation, when you're born into poverty, when you're born into exploitation, when you're born into rage against the unfairness of it, you don't know what you would be like in another situation. You know, a starting of knowing this is when the rage is turned out externally. Now, the colonial world is, divide, is a divided world. And he talks a lot about this. He says it's not just divided in terms of work. It's not divided in terms of ideology. It's divided in terms of space. It's divided in terms of rights. So if you take a look at page three, when he talks about the colonial sector, he's at the very bottom of page three, he says the colonized world is a world divided in two. It's Manichaean. Dividing line the border is represented by the barracks, the police barracks, the military barracks, and the police stations. In the colonies, the official legitimate agent, the spokesperson for the colonizer, and the regime of oppression is the police officer or the soldier. And then if you go over to page four, and the second paragraph there, about five lines down, and he says, you know, he talks about being governed by a purely Aristotelian logic, uh, a logic of identity and exclusion. The colonist sector is a sector built to last. All stone and steel, it's a sector of lights, paved roads where the trash cans are constantly over, the trash cans, sorry, constantly overflow with strange and wonderful garbage, undreamed of leftovers. It's a white folk section, a section of foreigners. And then, if you take a look at the colonized sector, the bottom paragraph, the shanty towns, the Medina, the reservation, it's a dis disreputable, disreputable, disreputable place, inhabited by disreputable, and I'm going to put that in quotation marks because Fanon is meaning that, people according to the colonial idea. You are born anywhere, anyhow, you die anywhere from anything. It's a world with no space. People are piled on top of one another. The shocks are squeezed tightly together. It's a famished section, hungry for bread, meat shops, coal, and light. 
It's a section that crouches and cowers, a section on its knees, a section that is prostate. It's a section that is going to jump. And, and so it's a section that, it's a section that is, because of the inequality, will, will um, enter motion. So I don't know if people here have seen shanty towns, been in shanty towns, lived in shanty towns. Um, you, if you have, okay, you'll immediately, you'll immediately recognize exactly what he's saying. So some of the shanty, I mean, I've seen, obviously, been in shanty towns in, in various locations. The ones outside of Mumbai are, uh, as you're driving, as you're driving from the airport into the, you know, um, middle class parts, um, are really striking if you've read Fanon in terms of just what he says. Um, you know, so the, the crowding, so, or if you've been in Brazil, for example, right? So, I mean, he's, he's really just, and, and you can understand, I mean, we can understand, but if you couldn't understand before seeing them, uh, you could really understand the rage. I mean, it's just, it really, um, it's a, partly an existential rage at a birth, because it's really contingent whether you're born to a family in a shanty town or you're born to somebody who's like in the tech industry. You know, so it's, and it's a rage that keeps Fanon says, and it's precisely what, you know, Benjamin talks about in terms of divine violence. It's a rage that will spill over. Now I want to play you, it's about six minutes, and I, since we've got good sound, I want to play you a, um, a film that was put together with images from what Fanon is saying about the, the two sectors. So let me just do that. Because I think, first of all, I think it's really effective. Um, and this partly draws on what we're reading right now, and it partly draws on a later section. But I think now is a good time. Capitalism in its early days saw in the colonies a source of raw materials, which once turned into manufactured goods, could be distributed on the European market. After a phase of accumulation of capital, capitalism has today come to modify its conception of the profit earning capacity of commercial enterprise. A blind domination founded on slavery is not, economically speaking, worthwhile. The colonies have become a market. Today, the colonized country's national struggle crops up in a completely new international situation. What the factory owners and finance magnates of the mother country expect from their government is not that it should decimate the colonial peoples, but that it should safeguard their own legitimate interests. The private companies put pressure on their own governments, at least to set up military bases for the purpose of assuring protection of their interests. Thus, there exists a sort of detached complicity between capitalism and the violent forces that <coughs> blaze up in the colonial territory. For centuries, the capitalists have behaved in the underdeveloped world like nothing more than war criminals. Deportations, massacres, forced labor, and slavery have been the main methods used by capitalism to increase its wealth, its gold and diamond reserves, and to establish its power. Not long ago, Nazism transformed the whole of Europe into a veritable colony. The governments of European nations called for reparations and demanded wealth which had been stolen from them. Cultural treasures, pictures, sculptures, and stained glass have been given back to their owners. The wealth of the imperial countries is our wealth too. Europe has stuffed herself excessively with the gold and raw materials of the colonial countries, Latin America, China, and Africa. From all these continents, under whose eyes Europe today raises up her tower of wealth, there has flowed out for centuries towards that same Europe, diamonds and oil, silk and cotton, wood and exotic products. Europe is literally the creation 
of the third world. The wealth which smothers her is that which was stolen from the underdeveloped peoples. The well-being and the progress of Europe had been built up with the sweat and the dead bodies of Negroes, Arabs, Indians, and the Asian races. We have decided not to overlook this any longer. from those who for centuries have kept it in slavery is that they will help it to rehabilitate mankind and make humanity victorious everywhere once and for all. Specialized in the Negro slave trade and owe their renown to millions of deported slaves. So when we hear the head of the European state declare with his hand on his heart, he must come to the aid of the poor, underdeveloped peoples. We do not tremble with gratitude. Quite the contrary. We say to ourselves, it's a just reparation to be paid to us. This help should be the ratification of a double realization. The realization by the colonized peoples that it is their due, and the realization by the capitalist powers that in fact, they must pay. But it's clear that we are not so naive as to think that this will come about with the cooperation and the goodwill of the European government. This huge tax, which consists of reintroducing mankind into the world, the whole of mankind, will be carried out with the indispensable help of the European peoples, who themselves must realize that in the past, they have often joined the ranks of our common masters. To achieve this, the European peoples must first decide to wake up and shake themselves, use their brains, and stop playing the stupid game of the sleeping beauty. show you, um, there's a whole series on concerning violence. This one is on raw materials. Um, it covers... Okay. Um, Franz Fanon? That's Beatrice Spivak. That's awesome. Um, so take a look on YouTube and see some of the concerning violence clips. What it is is a narration with images of Fanon's text. So everything you've heard, obviously, Fanon wrote. Um, it picks up, it starts, so they put together text from different segments. I think the raw materials we sort of need to hear um, because it, it really tells you or shows you the separate sections of the society. Which then, when you get to um, his claim that the colonial world is a Manichaean world, which is on page 15, well, he claims that on page six, but then if you go to page 15, it's a world compartmentalized. Um, and kind of later in the book, and I'm not sure you fully read, are fully responsible for reading this section, I think where the quote's from is, is uh, grandeur and weakness of spontaneity from that section, although I could be wrong. Um, but when you take a look at page 15, and it's the second, it's the last paragraph there, which you see is a world compartmentalized, Manichaean and petrified, a world of statues, the statue of the general who led the conquest, the statue of the engineer who built the bridge, a world closure, a world cocksure of itself, crushing with its stoniness the backbone of those who 
were scarred by the whip. This is the colonial world. The colonial subject is a man penned in. Apartheid is but one method of compartmentalizing the colonial world. The first thing the colonial subject learns is to remain in his place and not overstep its limits. Hence, the dream of the colonial subject are muscular dreams. Dreams of action, dreams of aggressive vitality. Fanon got this from the patients he was working with. I dream I'm jumping, swimming, running, climbing. I dream I burst out laughing. I'm leaping across a river and chased by a pack of cars that never catches up with me. During colonization, the colonial subject frees themselves at night, night after night, between nine in the evening and six in the morning. So Fanon also says that it's this period where what you see is violence turned inward, where, where, where you see black on black violence. And he starts that at the bottom of page 15. And I'll just read that, I'll come back to it. But he says, the colonized subject will first train this aggressive, aggressiveness sedimented in his, muscular, in his muscles against his own people. This is the period where black turns on black and police officers and magistrates don't know which way to turn when faced with a surprising surge of what they consider criminality, what they call North African criminality. So there's a section there where they, they, there's these descriptions of how the administrative government, that is the police, politicians, and military see the um, African subjects, the Algerian Africans. And the, what it says, is, is, is the way it's described is the way people lived, precisely as Fanon is describing here, sort of penned up um, only in a small area, no place to go, no means to go, and are only free in terms of their dreams. And when Fanon talks about as well as this sort of muscular, um, so you know, for those of us that have done body work, um, and I assume some people in class have done body work, it's really amazing, so you know, um, it's really amazing how what you what you hold in your muscles, okay? Or for people that do sports, you'll know that, right? Like muscle memory, um, what's held there. So so part of the whole thing in, in a liberation struggle um, is that you end up using your body differently and having a different relation to it, and your muscles end up changing in terms of muscle memory. Does that make sense? If not, I can take another run at it. I can ask sports people. But, but one of the things is we hold oppression in our body, okay? We hold oppression in our muscular structure. Um, as if, when we're acting in what Hegel would call an in itself, when we're stuck in an in itself situation, we will have violent rages that flare up and don't really, are not directed outward against the source of the problem. That we'll have like, we'll have like body traumas and, and body sicknesses. You know, so one of the things is, you know, if you're living, if you're living in poverty, you, your body, your life expectancy, until you actually f start acting as a for itself, is much less. Or you can't take it anymore. One of the things that happens is that there's a lot of suicides. There's like killing of, in, in terms of rage fights and suicides, particularly with young people. So I mean, Canada has a real, that's a real problem in, in northern communities in Canada. Um, and that's because of the, you know, I, mean, I don't have to tell, tell you this, but it's because of the lack of hope for the future, the lack of sort of any sort of going forward, the feeling of, of you know, being, being contained, not being able to go, not being able to get outside of where you are. So even in some places beautiful, as Patterton in, on, um, you know, uh, Nunavut, which is a beautiful, beautiful place, it's got a very high suicide rate because, you know, to get there you have to fly in in two different planes, um, and you're you're off the grid in many cases, right? So people, and there's not much for young people to do. It's a, I mean, it's it's also a dry area, which doesn't mean that there's no alcohol. It's officially a, a dry area. So. I mean, when, ta when reading Fanon, I think we also, because when he talks about reservations, et cetera, I think we also have to keep in mind what goes on in other locations today, what goes on in shanty towns, what goes on in reserves in, in Canada. 
Once the colonized subject realizes that their life, this is on page 10, paraphrase, that their life, their heartbeat, their breath is the same as the colonists. That is, that their skin is of the same worth as that of the colonizer. Then the colonized is acting as a for itself. So he uses Hegel's term there, page 10. He, actually that was, I think that was me saying, um, acting as a for itself. It's on the second paragraph there. The colonized subject discovers that his life, his breathing, and his heartbeats are the same as the colonists. He discovers that the skin of a colonist is not worth more than his own skin. So violence is first turned inward. And I should be on slide eight right now. Yeah, we'll go to that in a second. Violence is first turned inward. That is on page 17. What I, I read from page 15, it, he picks it up again on page 17. It's black turned on black violence or um, Algerian, I would say Algerian Arab turned on Algerian Arab violence. Um, the muscular tension of the colonized periodically erupts into bloody fighting between tribes, clans, and individuals. And Fanon says there's no, people say, look at how violent these people are. He says there's no way anyone could live in a violent situation and not manifest violence in their day-to-day -day life. But that is, is part, part of the situation one is, is living in. It's an, existential, it's, a, it's an existential existence, I guess. Or that's, it's an existential condition is what I was looking for. So national liberation, national renaissance, the restoration of a nationhood to the people, commonwealth, whatever may be the headings used or the formulas introduced, he says de decolonization because of the violence in existence has to be a violent phenomenon. That there's no way it won't be. That it's necessary. So Fanon came under a lot of critique for saying this, right? That there's no peaceful, there's no peaceful transition. What you get, Fanon is, is this, if Fanon is criticized, he's criticized for this claim that it necessarily has to be a violent phenomenon. And he says, and if you think about this for a couple of minutes, and I, I read it a few minutes ago, we simply revolt. We revolt simply because for many reasons we can no longer breathe. That, that it's, it's embedded in a collective body, it's embedded in an individual body. There's no breath in um, existence. You're, you're constricted. So Fanon is, because he's an existentialist, because he's a doctor, he really locates the physical manifestations and the psychological manifestations, but particularly physical manifestations, of colonialism in the body of those colonized. So during the liberation struggle, the colonized person who was considered a thing, an object, becomes a new human. Page 19. Become a new human giving food to the Mahajadeen, stationing lookouts, helping deprived families, taking over from the slain or imprisoned husband. Such are the practical tasks the people are asked to undertake in the liberation struggle. It's part of the process of becoming a new human being. Now he presents the nationalist parties. He presents the um, nationalist political parties on page 21 the same way that Sorel sees the parliamentary socialist parties. So if you go to page 21, he says that the political parties, and I'll read something in a second, he says that the political parties are in cahoots with business, with the business and intellectual elite. The supporters of the national parties are urban colonized who benefit from the regime. And he says that the sector which exists between the rural peasantry and, or this is the sector, so the, so the urban colonized are the sector that exists between the rural peasantry and the lumpen proletariat. 
Now, the London proletarian talks about on page 81, which is for next week, but let me just sort of set it out for you because London proletarian is a term that Fanon uses in a way it hadn't really been used before. He takes Marx's term and he applies it. And he says on page 81 that the lumpen proletariat is a cohort of starving human beings, divorced from tribe and clan. It constitutes one of the most spontaneously and radically revolutionary forces of a colonized people. And then I would say it has, so I mean, if you got the book, if you just go to page 81, well, I'll talk more about it. It's on the first paragraph there. Um, it really, is the spontaneous <coughs> spark of divine violence that uh, Benjamin's talking about. He says, it's among these masses, in the people of the shanty towns and in the lumpen proletariat, that the insurrection will find its spearhead. Because simply their bodies can't take it anymore. And he also says, um, in the section we're reading, he says, you know, you ask, it's very interesting because you say, okay, why did this revolution happen? I mean, you could be in the same situation. And then Ranciere does this um, right now to talk about the, the yellow vests, right? Mm -hmm. He says you could be in the same situation identically and this divine spark not break out. That, that it both could and could not. So it's this, it's this moment of possibility of, of it could, it could not, it's not predetermined as part of, a, a part of divine violence. The colonial society, the colonized and the colonizer, and we can't really imagine this, um, exist in what Fanon calls an atmosphere of violence. But you, you are born, you live in an atmosphere of violence, page 31. You know, so I mean, just a, a really good example of this, right? Okay, so yes, you know, um, in the news all weekend, they're looking for the person who's throwing furniture off a 30-floor balcony in Toronto, right? Which is a really awful act, and if it, if it hit anybody, they'd probably be killed, all right? But that is, I mean, that kind of tells you, in a sense, how privileged we really are. If that's the, if, if that's a real concern, I mean, I, I agree it should be a concern, okay? And, I, and the person turned themselves in, et cetera. But imagine the level of violence when you're in an atmosphere of violence that occurs all the time. Or, if, or, or talk to someone who's been in a war or an independent situation. That level of violence is, is so high, the atmosphere of violence is there's nothing not violent about it. I mean, that's why I think maybe one of the most important concepts in modern political thought, two of them are violence and technology. You know, because partly violence, we, we assume that we are living in a much less violent society until somehow we step out and we see what is happening to other people in the very society we live in, right? So in that sense, Fanon, Fanon's understanding of violence, the, because it's embedded in individual and collective bodies, because he understands it existentially as an atmosphere of violence, because he also understands that in colonial situations, it's virtually impossible to overthrow a regime without using violence because, he says, the regime itself has used so much violent force against the population. And then the regime will turn around and say, like, you know, these people are, are so violent. Where, you know, how can they be so violent? This, he's referring to the, the counter-violence of the, of the um, colonial subjects. And Fanon says they can be so violent because it's precisely the violence you taught them. He says the question on page 31 is how to get from this atmosphere of violence to really setting violence in motion. Like what spark will set it in motion? If you take a look at page 33, one of the things that happens is in a colonial struggle, Fanon says, the colonial governments and the national bourgeoisie are going to want to disarm the people. They're going to promise, they're going to want, they're going to promise a nonviolent transition. And he says, interestingly, but the very same regimes that accuse the colonial subject of moving too slow, of being lazy around independence, not being ready for it, that's always a term, not being ready for independence, are arguing, on page 35, that the colonized want to move too fast. 
In fact, their own leaders, Fanon says, accuse them of this in nation building. He says that if you don't watch it, the colonized, the bottom of 32, top of 33, um, if you don't watch it, the colonized who spontaneously invested their violence in the colossal, colossal task of destroying the colonial system soon find themselves chanting sterile so slogans, free X or Y. The colonial authorities then free these men and start negotiating. The time for dancing in the streets has arrived. And the time then for tying yourself, Fanon says, to um, an external regime is part of that. Now, he asked this question. I think it's a brilliant question on 33. I want to read it. Um, it's the bottom of 33, the second last paragraph, when he says, how is it, what aberration of the human mind drives these famished and feeble human beings, lacking technology, organized resources, to think that only violence can liberate them, faced with the occupier's military and economic might? How can they hope to triumph? So he's posing that question. And he says, and they do. So if you take a look at the situation, he's saying, how, how could you, when you start a struggle and join a struggle, how could you actually, when you don't have the resources, how can you actually hope to win? How can you hope to triumph? When you're faced with the occupier's military um, and economic might. And then he says something interesting on 34. Um, he says in 34 that the colonist, the colonial country, is capable today, and he's talking in the 60s, is capable of, he says, no colonial country is capable of mounting the only form of repression which would have a chance of succeeding. That is a large scale military occupancy because, two reasons. One, they have too many colonies, in the case of France, and two, at home the countries are faced with with workers' demands and constantation that require deployment of their security forces. So he says, okay, at a certain point, there's not enough security forces to keep um, a colonial resistance down if it's happening in more than one country and if you've got also resistance happening at home. He, all, he knows something interesting, um, and that is this new voice in 1960 and tone used by independent nations at the UN General Assembly. And remember, that's when Castro's there. Okay, so if you take a look at page 37, and he says, middle of 37, he says, understandable too is that new tone which dominated international diplomacy at the United Nations General Assembly in 1960, September. The representatives of colonial countries were aggressive and violent in the extreme but their populations found nothing exaggerated. The radicalism of the African spokespersons brought the absence, abscess to a head and shone the spotlight on the unacceptable nature of the veto on the collusion between major powers and above all on the insignificant role, role allotted to the third world. Then he goes down to Castro at the bottom and he says, likewise, Castro attending the UN in military uniform doesn't scandal the underdeveloped countries. What Castro is demonstrating is how aware he is of the continuing regime of violence. And Castro, of course, you can probably see footage of this. Castro, of course, stayed in Harlem when he went to the, the UN um, meeting. So the colonial regime was founded by force. It owes its existence to force. And it is only an armed struggle that will overthrow the regime. On page 42, Fanon says, the very same people who had constantly drummed into the colonial subject that the only language they understood was force, now the subject decides to express themselves with force and they don't know where they got it from. So I'm gonna read that just again because I think it's really important. It's on page, it's on page 42 and he says that during colonial occupation, the colonial administrators, the people who constantly drummed into the colonial subject that the only language they understood was force, now decide to express themselves with force against those who they were accusing of force. 
And Fanon says it better than I am paraphrasing here. It's at the very bottom of 42. The argument chosen by the colonized was conveyed to them by the colonist, and by an ironic twist of fate, it is now the colonized who state that it is the colonizer who only understands the language of force. He also says in 42 that the colonist has always shown them the path they should follow to liberation. What happens then is that work takes on a new meaning. Okay, work takes on a new meaning. This is on page 44, so it's one page past what you were supposed to read, and I'll, I'll pick it up again next week or the week after reading it, but I just want to talk a little bit about it. Work takes on a new meaning. To work is to work towards the death of the colonist. So work has a new meaning. Work is colonial resistance. Work is the liberation struggle. It's work towards the death of the colonist. And he says also on page 44, which I'll, I'll come back to next week, he says, the colonized human the colonized human liberates self in and through violence. Now, this is a new understanding of violence. It's not present in, in Sorel or Benjamin. And I want to talk about it today, and I'll talk about it again after reading week. But it's, it's a new understanding of violence that's, that Fanon contributes to the, the debate, and also um, Anne Césaire contributed to the debate as well. That is the idea, and Steve Biko um, picks it up in South Africa. But it's the idea, it's the understanding that the colonized human liberates themselves in and through violence. So it's, it's, it got, it's got a positive, constructive, constructing aspect. He also says then that violence is man or human recreating himself. That violence is the recreation of self, a becoming a for itself in a situation or in an atmosphere of violence. And again, I want to go back to this. Where, he's, where Fanon says we revolt simply because for many reasons we can no longer breathe. But at a certain point, and this is very much influenced by Hegel, that at a certain point um, one realizes that they're responsible for the extraction of natural resources, for the building of the country. Um, they move from being an in itself to a for itself. They can, no longer, they can no longer breathe. That's to say there's a stage. There's a stage where the violence of the colonial regime and the counter-violence of the colonized produce what Fanon calls a homogeneity. Or if you look at Hegel, they produce uh, a configuration. So once the colonized use counter-violence, that is, they counter what is used against them. They counter the regime with counter violence. They counter the, regi they counter the violence of the regime. Now, for Algeria, the tipping point in armed struggle was 1955, where there was a repression of every sector of the colonized populations. 12,000 people were killed in Philipp Philippville. Uh, there's a famous battle called the Battle of Philipville, which was part of the Algerian war between France and Algerian rebels, between France and the FLN. And it took place August 20th, 1955. It was in this Algerian town of Philipville. The FLN, and you can see, um, you can see film footage of it on YouTube. Um, what the FLN did was it made attacks on surrounding areas. What you had, and I think this is what's interesting to see in the film footage, if, you, if I go back here, no, that's not, that's from the film, but it's after independence is won. Anyway, that's, 
an interesting slide. Um, what the FLN, the Front for the uh, Liberation, National Liberation, what it did is you see thousands of basically local Muslim peasants armed with clubs, sticks, axes, knives, pitchforks, um, descend upon Philippeville with the intention of killing French colonialists. And what you have in response is the French military parachuting in and responding with artillery. And then the French police standing by while the, well, French Algerians, so that's the French Algerians who are um, in government, engaged in a massive retaliation after the funeral of the French Algerians who were killed. So you end up with a death toll of 12,000 Algerian Muslims and 71 French Algerians. And this is what Fanon sees as the point of no return. And partly he says it again and again, he says that one of the problems, and he finds his patients saying this, that one of the problems that happens in a colonial regime is when the colonized subject is tortured, when the, the co colonial subject is, their wife is killed or raped, they can't complain to anyone because everyone has noted that not a single French person has ever been brought before a French court of justice for the murder of an Algerian. So just to back up a little bit, I think, I think I'll end with this and then I want to back up just a little bit. That the founding violence of the, the co colonialist can only brought, be brought to a halt when the colonial regime is destroyed. Partly and largely because the arrival of the colonist, this is on page 50, but I want to read it here and I'll come back to it next week. That the arrival of the colonist signifies the death of indigenous society, of its cultural heritage, and a petrification of the individual's development. That when the, when the colonial power arrives, what you get is the death of indigenous society, you get the death of indigenous culture, and a petrification of the individual's development, a freezing of their personhood. Which means then that life can only materialize from, from what Fanon calls the rotting cadaver of the colonist, that the, the colonist has to be displaced violently for life to emerge for the colonial subject, now the new human being. Okay, I'm gonna end there, but I wanna pick a couple of of things up for two minutes before uh, we go. One is, with Fanon's talking about in terms of the, um, what can be considered the Phillipsville massacre, when the 12,000 um, Algerian Muslims are killed. What he's talking about there is the force of the state. So, that when, so the force of the state is you've got the military parachuting in, paratroopers coming in, you've got the police, and you've got this resistance of local people living there, fighting with the tools they work with. Um, and the massacre that happened after that, so when the, Al when the French Algerians were killed, um, and then there was a funeral, what happened after the funeral of the 71 French Algerians that were killed is, and these are the colonial administrators, French Algerians is a really important distinction, um, what happened after this is the police just stood by and allowed them to massacre 12,000 people that lived in the area. And that's kind of the spark that really brought the, the, the um, what, the impetus for uh, a liberation struggle to its head when, when that was seen. So that's seen as being the, when you could no longer take it anymore. But I think what's important is to understand the image of like fighting with what you have available against the force of the state. So that would be the, the counter violence of the tools available, tools you work with for the state that you're fighting against, right? For the profits of that state used against the state in the face of the force of the state, not only the, the materials that are on the ground there, but stuff that was brought in because France parachuted stuff in because Algeria was the first resistance.
Okay, so they wanted to stop it, so then you didn't have like Angola, Angola Mozambique, like which were Portuguese colonies, but they, but they wanted to stop it right there. And they had the backing of, of the UN um, to do that, right? So that's why he's talking about the change in the, um, what's going on at the UN in 1960 and the anger of the um, representatives from uh, the Global South. Okay, any questions that I might have, that, that may not be sort of clear on, on that? Yes, um, so we're, we're using the word colonist like, uh, as a book, like different from colonizer in the way. Yeah, sure. Uh, oh, just a sec, you mean the colonized and the colonial subject and the colonists are those who are on the ground of colonizers. So one of the things I did was I sort of set it out there. The colonist and colonizer are a force of the state, okay? The colonizer, colonial subjects use the violence of resistance. So what's the difference between the colonist and the colonizer? Well, I'm not sure there necessarily is. I'm not sure Fanon makes a distinction um, because he uses them kind of interchangeably at points, right? But I wanted to make sure that we knew what he was talking about the colonist and the colonizer is, is those of the, the force of the state, whereas the colonized or the colonial subject is, is those who are uh, indigenous to the area. Why, did you have a comment on that? It, I've, I've read like, um, uh, I think it's Alfred Nemi. Yes. Uh, he makes a distinction between does. people who like just come with the regime for like business. So they're the colonists. Yes. Yeah, that's a good distinction, right? I was, that's very interesting because I was thinking also of putting um, Mimi on the course, right? And I might do that. That's a good distinction. But they, so they basically buy into and benefit from the ideological superstructure, but they're not sort of actively engaged in maintaining the, the colonial powers control of the area, except business-wise they are. So yeah, I don't, I didn't get a sense of Fanon was making that distinction. Um, but Mimi does, and it's a great book. So yeah, thanks. Anybody else on that? No, it's, a, it's an important distinction because partly, if you're benefiting from a regime and you're complicit in it, in a way we can see ourselves as part of, and it becomes a really good political tool, right? Because you know, if you're in a regime and you're benefiting from it, we can see ourselves as colonists, but maybe not colonizers. You know, if we're benefiting from the subjugation of uh, population in Canada. So yeah, that's an important distinction, that's good. Anybody else? And it's a sophisticated distinction too, and it's a Marxist distinction, right? So you've got, you know, the colonizer as the active agents and forces that production, and you've got the, the colonist, um, and that could also have an A there too, a colonist and co colonialist. Um, but you've got them benefiting ideologically and from the forces of production that are set in their favor. So that, that becomes good. Okay, let's take a 15 minute break. Let's